Word, we will be in Revelation chapter 14. And we saw last week at the end of Revelation 13 in that famous passage on the mark of the beast, we saw that for Christians there is great suffering and persecution. And we even look to a time that Jesus calls the Great Tribulation, which will be at the very end of time, immediately before Jesus returns to the earth. And the idea is that persecution is going to get worse and worse for Christians as time goes on until the time before Jesus comes back. Can you turn the monitors down some? I'm getting feedback. Thank you. So, he says here, that there is going to be a time of such great suffering that there will be the, the mark of the beast which you will have to receive in order to buy or sell. Basically, you won't have food or clothing or anything unless you are willing to worship the beast and to do these wicked things that Satan is leading, the false prophet and his beast, the Antichrist, to lead people into doing. And so we saw last week how bad it is for Christians and how much worse it will get until the time when Jesus comes back to this earth and we might be thinking to ourselves, I don't want to go through this. I don't know if it's worth it. I don't want to suffer like that. And that's why immediately after the, the terrible reality of what's coming in the future, we have in Revelation chapter 14 some very comforting words. Because it may be bad for Christians who are persecuted for this short time that we are here on this earth, but there's eternity in heaven awaiting us. And then what this passage is also going to show, you know who's really going to suffer? You know who really has it bad? Those who took the mark of the beast to try to by some temporary relief, they ensured for themselves eternal torment. Revelation 14 is a passage which compares the joy of heaven and the agony of hell and invites every one of us to choose which one you want. Revelation chapter 14, after this terrible vision of the persecution that we will go through in the time before Jesus returns, we read these words in Revelation 14 verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with Him 144,000 who had His name and His Father's name written on their foreheads. Now to explain what's happening here in verse 1, notice that He looks and there's Jesus, the Lamb, who had been slain from before the foundation of the earth, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. There He is, standing on Mount Zion, which, which yes, is Jerusalem, but also in Revelation becomes a picture of heaven, Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem, the eternal heaven. And Jesus is standing there, and with Him He has the 144,000. These are those who were mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. They were people from every tribe, every language, every nation, every tongue. Those who had been purchased with the Lamb's blood. Those who had been born again and redeemed from the earth. They are those who suffer and die and who have come out of the great tribulation, it said in chapter 7. And they are those who will rule and reign and live with Jesus forever in heaven. The 144,000 is not a numerical limit on how many people will be in heaven as some people have said before. No, the 144,000 is a way of saying all of God's people. He calls them 144,000 in chapter 7 and then he says it's a great multitude. It's more people than the grains of sand on the seashore, which is a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And so these people that, that are there with the Lamb, they are all the redeemed of God, all the saved who will live in heaven with Jesus, who will reign with Him forever. This is everyone from Adam until today, until the day when Jesus comes again who has trusted in Jesus Christ, there John sees them standing on Mount Zion in heaven 
with the Lamb. And look what is written. Jesus' name and His Father's name is written on their foreheads. Now what we just saw at the end of chapter 13 is that during the time of the Great Tribulation, people received the mark of the beast 666 so that they can buy and sell and get themselves some temporary relief from the persecution that will happen in those days. There are those who have the mark of the beast written on their foreheads. Those are the lost. Those are the ones who don't trust in Christ. And then there are those who have Jesus' name and His Father's name written on their foreheads. And they are the ones who have eternal life. You are either one or the other. You either bear the mark of the beast belonging to Satan and following the prince of the power of the air, or you have Jesus' name written upon you. This is where my favorite hymn, the, the, um, Before the Throne of God Above, this is where it gets the line, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. And in that song it says, My name is graven on His hands. My name is written on His heart. I know that while in heaven He stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. My name is written on Him. His name is written on me. I am His. He is mine. I belong to Him. And we have Jesus' name written on our foreheads. Not literally, okay? You don't need to get a Jesus tattoo across your forehead. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying here is, your name is graven upon His hands and His name is graven upon your forehead as if to say, it cannot be erased. You belong to Him. This is unchangeable. Your eternity is secure in Christ. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. Imagine this deafening roar. Remember in Revelation 1, the roar of many waters, like standing at Niagara Falls and the the water crashing is just deafening. This is the sound of the power of God in heaven. And the voice that I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. Now this new song is sung because something is happening here which has never happened before. And that is all the people of God are finally gathered together for eternity. And John is looking forward to the day he looks past the temporary persecution that we will go through in this world and He looks forward to our eternal reward. And on that day, a new song will be sung because the old has passed away and the new has come and now there is eternal life forever for those who trust in Christ. And so on that day, we will sing a a new song because none of our current songs are worthy of the praise and the majesty that we will express on that day. They were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. You can't sing that song unless you belong to Jesus. If you were outside of Christ, you can't sing that song. You can't take joy in Christ unless you know Him personally. You can't truly worship Him. Oh, you may be able to mouth the words, but you can't express joy and worship from within your heart unless you belong to Him. Unless your word is 144,000, the redeemed of God. Verse 4 says, It is these, those who belong to Jesus, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Now you might ask, wait a minute, what? What is he talking about? Throughout the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, Sexual purity is pictured as a way of expressing how we must be faithful to God. The the most famous passage in the Bible for this is Ezekiel chapter 16, where it is said that the nation of Israel was unfaithful to God and worshipped other gods like a wife who had been unfaithful to her husband and committed adultery. And so in passages like Ezekiel 16 and literally dozens of other passages throughout the Old Testament prophets, we see that 
the idolatry and worshiping of other gods compared to a husband or a wife being unfaithful to their spouse. And so here when it says that those who belong to Jesus, that, that they are pure, what it's saying is, is they've not worshipped other gods. This is spiritual fidelity. Obviously, it's not saying that all Christians are single, right? In which case, if you're married, you're tough out of luck. No, that's not what it's saying. Obviously, this has a spiritual meaning. That is, they belong to Jesus and they worship Jesus alone. They refuse to bow the knee to anyone else. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. He explains what He means by saying that, that it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, they're virgins. He says, here's what I mean by that. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They won't follow anyone else. They only will follow Jesus. That's the meaning. And the point is, they're with Jesus because they followed Him wherever He went. No matter what the cost, no matter what the price, those who belong to Jesus, who have His name graven on their foreheads, they follow Him and they receive eternal life. These have been redeemed from mankind. Not just from Israel, not just from one nation. From all of mankind, these people have been redeemed as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no lie, for they are blameless. Does this mean Christians never lie? I've told a lie before. Does that mean I'm not going to heaven? No, what it's saying is, is that Christians have been forgiven and they have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And when God looks on the one who has been born again by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, God does not see your sin, your lies, your past. God sees the perfect spotless righteousness of His Son Jesus Christ, which you have been clothed in to cover up the shame of your sin. And so when God looks at us, He doesn't see a bunch of liars. He sees those who are blameless. He sees those who are blameless in whose mouths there is found no lie. Verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. I love this description of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the eternal, unchanging Gospel. It is the message which has been the same from the beginning until the end. Eternal is that which has no beginning and no end. For all time, it's been one message of salvation for all those who trust in Jesus Christ. It's the eternal Gospel. It's always been the only message of salvation. The eternal Gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is to be proclaimed to everyone who dwells upon the earth. To every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. This is our mission until Jesus comes back, brothers and sisters. To proclaim the eternal Gospel to the ends of the earth. Verse 7, and he, the angel, said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. Now why would he say fear God? Because after reading chapter 13 and the mark of the beast and the suffering that we'll go through, we might be afraid of Satan and afraid of man, right? He says, no, don't be afraid of Satan. Don't be afraid of man. Fear God. He's the one you should be concerned about. Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. You just make sure you're good with God. Don't worry about the rest. Verse 8, Now another angel comes to warn us. And he says, Another angel a second followed saying, Fallen! Fallen! is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Babylon the great is going to be shown later in chapter 17 and 18 as this evil world system that worships Satan and false gods. Babylon the great is essentially everything that is not a part of Christ and His kingdom. 
Babylon the Great is this worldly system that people follow after instead of Jesus Christ. Every false religion is a part of Babylon. And we are told here that fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. All those who have trusted in other gods, all those who have trusted in other so-called saviors, other religions, all those who said they didn't believe in God but really knew better in their hearts, everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ on that day will find that they are fallen, destroyed, under the judgment and the wrath of God. She who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Once again here, this is being shown as unfaithfulness to God. This is spiritual infidelity. This is that those people worshipped other gods and refused to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. But on this day, they will bow the knee to Jesus Christ, but not to worship Him. But they will bow the knee in His judgment as He crushes them with the weight of their sin and its punishment. Verse 9, another angel comes to warn us. And another angel, a third, followed the first two. He followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of His anger, and He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now listen to this description of hell in verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. This is why you should fear God and not man. Because this is the end of those who fear man rather than God. This third angel comes and he says, If anyone worships the beast and its image, if anyone receives the mark of the beast on his forehead or on his hand, If you are unwilling to suffer for Christ and you take what you think is the easy way out and go with the flow of this world, hear me young people, hear me older people, hear me everyone, if you try to take the easy way out, it will not be easy on that day. You will regret that decision. If you go with this evil world system, if you don't follow Jesus wherever He goes, but follow the world wherever it goes, then you will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of His anger. What in the world is He talking about? We're Baptists. What's all this about wine and stuff? Well, I'm glad you've asked. The passages that are being alluded to here throughout the Old Testament the the, the most important of which is Jeremiah chapter 25. And if I were to take you to Jeremiah chapter 25, you would see that there, the judgment against sinners for their sin is, is likened to wine that is poured into a cup and then the, 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 the wicked people who've refused to repent of their sins and bow the knee to God, they are forced to drink the cup of the wine of God's wrath and so be drunk and crazed and stagger and be crushed by the weight of their sin. In other words, this cup and the wine that the cup holds is symbolic of the punishment for sin that is awaiting the one who does not bow the knee to Jesus Christ. This cup is the judgment against sinners for their sin. And we are told what it will look like when they drink this cup. It will be poured full strength with the cup of God's anger, and the one who has to drink the cup of God's wrath will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. One of the the lies or just the, the falsehoods of of modern thought about hell is that it's a place where God is absent, that God is not there. I don't know where people get this idea from. They didn't get it from the Bible. If you read Psalm 139, 
the psalmist David clearly says that God, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. This is the description of hell. It is a place of fire and sulfur where people will suffer forever and ever. They will be in torment. They will have no rest either day or night. These who worship the beast in its image, who thought they were taking the easy way out, but in the end find that they took the most difficult, the most terrible, the hardest way of all. They end up in the lake of fire forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, here's what we are being told. You can either take the mark of the beast or you can take the name of Jesus Christ. You have a choice to make. Follow this world or follow Jesus. You will end up in either heaven or hell. It's your choice. But if you choose wrongly, this is how it will end for you. And this is a grave warning. And it's given here so that those of us who will have to suffer and be persecuted for the sake of Jesus Christ will read these words and will say, I may have to suffer now, but eternal joy is waiting for me and it's worth it. So that when we face suffering in this fallen, evil world, Babylon the Great, we will say, I don't care because it's worth it because I know what's waiting me for me and I know what's waiting for them. And I don't want to go where they're going. I want to go with Jesus. I know what my end is. And whatever I have to suffer while I am waiting for Jesus to come back, it's worth it. That's the point of the passage. It's worth it to follow Jesus. This is the song of the redeemed. This is the, the message and, and, and the song that we will sing in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb. He is the one who rescued and saved us. And He is worth it. He is worthy. In the end, we will be glad that we follow Jesus and not this world. Verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. He says this is the point. Endure. When you have to suffer in this world, endure. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So when you face hardship, when you face, face suffering persecution, remember, it's worth it. And here in verse 12, we're just being told, John says, this is the point. You need to endure. Hard times will come. Keep following Jesus. Endure. Verse 13. Look at what we have waiting for us. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Do you hear that? When you die, when you leave this earth, you die in the Lord and you are blessed. From now on, ever since Jesus paid for your sin upon the cross, from that day forward, those who die and have trusted in Christ they go to eternal joy with Him. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Their deeds follow them is a way to say the suffering that they endured for Christ on this earth, the hardship that they went through, it's worth it in the end. Their deeds follow them. The one who would lose his life in this world for my sake, Jesus said, He will save His life in eternity. And the one who tries to save His life in this world by taking the mark of the beast and following Babylon the Great, He will lose His life and suffer in eternity. It's worth it. Now in verse 14, we are told that one day soon, Jesus will come back as judge and He will harvest those who live upon the earth. 
And there is only one of two destinies for everyone on that great judgment day when this great harvest of souls will take place. Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. The sickle would be used to cut the grain off at the, at the ground and harvest the grain. And here is Jesus pictured like one like a son of man, quoting Daniel 7.13, and He is coming again. This is the day when Jesus comes back. And when He comes back, He comes with a sickle to harvest the earth, to judge every man, woman, and child. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat upon the cloud. And the angel calls to Jesus and says, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap is come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And when that time comes and Jesus returns to this earth, He will judge every person. Verse 16 says, So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, And the earth was reaped. Every man, woman, and child now has to stand before Him in judgment. Now we're going to see that judgment, the great white throne judgment, later in chapter 20. There's going to be an interlude here where we see some of the judgment that God is going to pour out upon the earth until that time. But we're being told here that when Jesus comes back, there will be a judgment. And everyone, everyone, The whole earth will stand before Him on that day. Verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vines of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. And so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and he gathered the grape harvest of the earth and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city. And the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Now, why are there two harvests here? Well, there's two harvests here, like later in chapter 20, there will be two resurrections. The first will be the resurrection of the righteous. The second resurrection will be the resurrection of those who will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Here there are two harvests. The first is a harvest of grain. The second is a harvest of grapes that will be trodden out and the wrath of God will be poured out upon the earth. You see, the first harvest is of believers. The second harvest is of unbelievers. Those in the first harvest are spared and given eternal life. Those of the second harvest are gathered together, thrown into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and they are crushed. And we are told in verse 20 that their blood flowed out of the winepress as high as a horse's bridle. You know how tall a horse stands, don't you? The blood flowed as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia, which is about 600 feet or two football fields. That's a lot of blood. Five feet deep or so for about two football fields. Now, it's just these huge numbers and this massive amount of blood to say that will be the judgment of those who refuse to bow the knee to Christ, who take the mark of the beast, who follow this evil world system, Babylon the Great, and who do not follow Jesus. The warning here is, don't go with them. Don't bear the weight of your sin. Don't be made to drink the cup of the wine of God's wrath on the day of judgment. Why is it the cup of God's wrath? Why is it that the Bible continually describes the the judgment of God as a cup? I mean, of all the things that would scare us, a, a cup's not the scariest object, right? Why is it that way? 
Well, like I said, it began in the Old Testament with many of the prophets describing God's judgment against sinner as the cup of God's wrath. But it's most important because do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And just before He was arrested on that night and would be crucified the next day, He went in the Garden and what did He pray? Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And three times he prayed, God, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And the Bible says in Luke's Gospel that the third time he prayed the prayer, he sweat drops of blood on the ground. He was so stressed out. What cup was Jesus so afraid of? This cup right here. The judgment that you and I deserve for our sin. And Jesus drank that cup full measure and full strength. Which is to say, when Jesus died on the cross, He did not merely suffer nails through His hands and feet, as excruciating as that was. But the real suffering of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary is when the Father crushed His own Son with the weight of your sin and made Jesus drink the cup of God's wrath that you and I would have had to drink forever in eternal hell. You saw the description of hell as a place of fire where the smoke of their torment goes up day and night and they never have rest? Well, that judgment for you was poured out upon Jesus when He was nailed to that cross. And when Jesus went to that cross, He suffered much more than the nails. He suffered what you would have suffered in eternal hell. That's why Isaiah 53 says that it was God's pleasure and it was His will to crush His own Son so that by His suffering, many would be made righteous. That's why when we take the Lord's Supper together, we repeat what Jesus told us to repeat. That after supper, Jesus took the cup and He said, this cup. He could have said this wine, but no. He said this cup. The punishment that you deserve for your sin, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink this cup in remembrance of me and the fact that I paid for your sin upon Calvary's cross. As horrible as the reality of hell is, you must realize something. Someone had to pay for your sin. And that person was Jesus Christ. And for you to say, no, I don't want that. I'll gladly drink the cup of the judgment of God for my sin. You would be a fool. Jesus drank that cup for you. Would you turn from your sin? Would you refuse to follow this world? And would you follow Jesus wherever He goes? Wherever He leads? Will you follow Him? It will be worth it. And on that last day, you will sing a new song. And there will be joy forever in heaven. The road is narrow. The way is hard, Jesus said. But it leads to life. There are few who find it. But it's worth it. So will you follow Jesus down that road? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, I pray that your spirit would write it upon our hearts. Lord, for those who are here this morning who have not bowed the knee to Christ who have not repented their sins and placed their faith in Jesus, I pray that Your Spirit would open their eyes and grant them the gift of faith that they would run to Christ and be saved. God, help us to remember that You are working out Your eternal plans and whatever we have to suffer until the time when Jesus comes back, it's worth it. Thank You that Jesus drank the cup of Your wrath, the punishment for our sin, when He died on the cross in our place. We praise Him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.